Duhem thesis on method and history of physics. The greatest ideal of exact sciences is to know what is true and certain, with any speculations or hypotheses separated. Few times through the history, this ideal has been achieved in the most important theories of physics. First of all, such a theory allows us to calculate and predict many unknown facts that we couldn't guess in any other way. This confirms that the theory indeed corresponds to the real relations between measured quantities. This very feature of physical theory allows the development of technology. In pre-modern engineering, work was often done by trial and error. With engineering based on physics, we can precisely calculate how the device would work and adjust the project much better. Secondly, a carefully formulated physical theory could maintain its validity with the progress of physics, despite the appearance that old theories are replaced by new ones. In such a case, if the progress of experimental physics updates our knowledge, the theory is not being refuted, but instead is revealed to be a special case of a new, more precise, and more general theory. In this way, a good physical theory fulfills the best template of scientific knowledge, not only by providing knowledge about the world, but also by being true in all of its content. This last feature is instrumental in the progress of physics, ensuring that we don't waste our efforts and don't grope in the dark. One theory clearly paves the way for new theories that are more complex and precise, becoming their building block and a template for strictly incremental growth of knowledge. Certainly, this template was not always implemented, but it can be found in the works of Newton, Ampere, or Euler. However, it is easy to depart from it, creating a theory mixed with ideology and speculations, blurring the boundaries of physics, and consequently damaging its progress. Thus, the question about the details of the method of physics is important. Numerous writers have insisted that science is based on experience, but that doesn't help much. Almost all human investigations are based on experience in some sense and not based on experience in others. Rather, what matters is the way a given field is based on experience. Physiologists are often concerned with sets of facts and relationships that connect directly observable objects. For instance, the neural connection of a hand allows the patient to move it. When these connections are ruptured, the patient will lose control of the hand. In physics, no similar approach is possible. A physicist uses complex abstractions to assign numbers and symbols to phenomena. These symbols are then used in equations to describe real relationships in nature. Physiologists usually do not expect such relationships to be found, nor can they follow the physicist in assuming that such relationships are unchanging and universal in the entire world. On the contrary, the human body is highly complex and only partially understood, and treatment often involves decision-making subject to risk and uncertainty. Thus, to set physics on a path to explosive progress, physicists needed a profoundly different approach than other empirical scientists. Some aspects of the method were strongly developed, while others were deprecated. These are certainly important aspects. How physical quantities are created. What constitutes a physical theory, what belongs to it, and what does not belong to it. How and why a physical theory can be confirmed by experience. How and why a physical theory can be applied to describe phenomena. Answer is not obvious and at the same time very relevant. No ancient culture developed advanced physics and those few scientific traditions that achieved something were quickly stuck. At the same time, other sciences have developed quite well in many cultures. Here are answers to above questions, adopted by modern physics in its most critical discoveries. First of all, physical quantity is a set of abstract analogies and assumptions. Few quantities are constructed simply by decomposition into parts, such as length, volume, or angle. These were known in antiquity and adopted by ancient natural philosophy. Other physical quantities are much more complex. To conceive a temperature, one needs to consider sets, equivalence classes, of things that are equally warm. A number is assigned in such a way that, for everything, things that are warmer from it have a greater number, while those that are colder have a smaller number. But what is warmer or colder? With the quantity, a hypothesis is introduced. When two bodies are put in contact, a warmer body gives a quantity of heat to a colder body so that they become equally warm, according to a certain relation of proportionality. This is the first and second law of thermodynamics. Of course, much more is needed. 
being in contact or being isolated needs to be defined. The temperature expansion of liquids is postulated to measure the temperature by measuring the height of the column of liquid in the thermometer. In this way, a physical quantity is a theoretical interpretation. Secondly, physical theory, in its best form, is a description of the order among measured quantities, for example among mass, force, and acceleration, among gas pressure, temperature, and volume, and so on. Such theories, limited to the descriptive part, discover what can be confirmed by experience and what is most needed by both physicists and engineers alike, without any unnecessary additions. Images, explanations, and intuitions added to the theory can be useful for our minds, but they are usually not real or true and should not be conflated with the theory itself. Many times, such explanations and images turned out to be false, every time significant progress in physics was made. Third, any theory that meets the above criterion is possible, as long as it is consistent with experience. Every theory of physics, particularly each of the current theories, can be modified in many ways by altering the equations or the parameters, resulting in a great number of similar theories. Only experiments which provide accurate predictions of quantities can determine which of these theories are correct or wrong. No theory of physics is a logical necessity, and no theory follows from reason alone, as Enlightenment philosophers desired. Fourth, theories of physics describe order that is universal and unchanging in time. To put it different, theories work the same in every place and time. If a phenomenon is interpreted with use of the theory and the interpretation is corroborated by accurate predictions, then same phenomenon elsewhere can be described in identical way. It must be noted, however, that the theory is conventional, that it has limited precision, and that it is just one out of countless possibilities. Consequently, one should not assume that same theory will work for different scale, for different phenomena, and for much greater precision. History of physics has lots of evidence that such assumption might be false and should be rather tested by experience in every specific case. These are the foundations we have outlined. We recognize them now by looking at few hundred years of development of physics. The difficult part, however, was to figure them out by trial and error before first modern physical theories emerged, because they are contained within modern physical theories. Physics that now lures so many minds with most illustrious achievements had to be built in the times when a faith in such a future could look absurd. There is no other source for the method of physics than scholastic theology and related philosophy. It was inherited by the architects of physics of 16th and 17th century. Here's how it worked. According to the Book of Wisdom, chapter 11, God made everything according to measure, number, and weight, which helped to consider phenomena in analogy to measurement and weight. In the 13th and 14th centuries, scholastics replaced qualitative forms with abstract quantities, allowing them to consider the quantity of heat the quantity of motion, or the time derivatives of quantities, rates of change of quantities. This went against the Aristotelian point of view, which only accepted essential relationships as quantities, such as length or volume. Nicole Oresme developed a primitive graphical calculus of integrals and applied it to kinematics, while Buridan refined the notion of quantity of motion. These two discoveries paved the way for Newton's gravity and dynamics. Christian Revelation points out that the world is comprehensible and ordered, but it also emphasizes another principle that places strong limits on trust in any rational speculation about physics. This principle can be called the contingency thesis or principle of abundance, as one of Dirac biographers does. If we imagine any non-contradictory set of laws of physics, it is possible that there is another universe with these specific laws, as omnipotent God could create it. Similarly, any consistent theories that agree with all our present experiences are not impossible. Consequently, almost no physical hypotheses are refuted a priori, and no laws of physics are a logical necessity known by reason without experience. This principle in the late 13th century allowed scholastics to modify Aristotle's physics and discredit the beliefs of ancient paganism, such as the belief in an organic, animate world the influence of celestial bodies on events on earth, 
and the eternal recurrence of all things. For that reason, the Bishop of Paris's condemnation of 1277 against philosophers was called by Duhem a birth certificate of modern science. The Book of Sirach, chapter 16, points out that the ordering of the world is unchanging and universal, and this inanimate order is separate from the domain of living creatures. This observation, along with another article of Christian faith claiming that God exists beyond the world and separate from it, served as the foundation for 6th century Christian John Philoponus and 14th the century scholastic John Buridan. They were among the largest contributors to the following doctrine. Both the heavens and things on earth are ruled by the same laws, contrary to the typical opinion of the pagans. In the beginning, God ordered and set in motion the heavenly spheres by giving them a quantity of motion. The same inspiration by the notion of a rational creator who ordered all things with finesse can be found among modern scientists such as Newton in his Principia or Euler and Maupertuis, who justified their discovery of the variational principle. These are the only sources for the method of physics. No alternatives can be found, as other dominant currents of scientific philosophy typically fail on all the above-mentioned topics. Strong realists, such as mechanists of the Enlightenment, gave absolute certainty to either classical mechanics or other physical theories and built explanatory theories on them. When the theories got modified, strong realist positions were thoroughly refuted and had to be rebuilt from scratch. Positivists claimed the unity of the method of all sciences, neglecting the profound differences in method of physics.